Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share you, you know, a couple of slides uh, you know, to, to, you know, to talk you through about my topics. Can everyone see my slides? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so um, the, um, the, talk that I'm, uh, the talk that I'm going to focus on today is about you know, uh, Rabindranath Tagore's uh, visit to Siam's in 1927s and how that visit has you know, contributed you know, to you know, the idea of the world and also you know, the ideals of education in Thailand. Uh, so uh, my talk, you know, will you know will be organized around the the, the title to go on natures and learning. Well, in October 1927, uh, Rabindranath Tagore you know, has come to visit uh, different institutions and also you know, the king and the queens of Siam's. Uh, well, the main the the, um, the main objectives of his visit was to raise the funding for uh, for uh, Vishwaparthi or uh, uh, and you know, his school in Shanti Niketan, and also you know, to uh, to get to know you know more you know about you know the the countries of Siam's and also you know, the regions. So you know during his visit, you know he has you know, visited many places and also. Uh, have met with you know a number of dignitaries. You know, for instance, and then the uh, the persons that, are, that you know standing with him in his photos. You know, he uh, his name was uh, Prince Damrong Rashanipap. You know, who was the uh, the well, the most prolific and also you know renowned scholars on uh, Thai on Thailand and. And, and and also into you know, the Asian cultures. So uh, you know, during his, his visit, you know, a lot of newspapers in Thailand, you know, has been reported on uh, on his visit. You know, for example, you know, this Daily Mail, you know, from uh, from the twelfth of October, nineteen twenty-seven, uh, has made a report, you know, about you know his. Uh, uh, to go speech you know, to the king and the queen of Siam's during that time, you know, when Thailand was called Siam's, about the unity of cultures. Uh, and you know, never mind you know, the main headlines of you know, this, this, these newspapers, but, uh, but, but you can see that you know, the, you know, the, the, main, the, uh, the main topics of you know, to go talks you know, uh, on that day was you know to appeal you know for tolerance and also you know for the unities and also you know the inter exchange you know of uh, of cultures between nations, which you know from what I've read you know because you know that was uh, the period you know before, just you know before the Second World War and also uh, it was you know the the period you know like you know we are living in now today. You know, it was you know, it was in the beginning of the Great Depressions, and also there were a lot of uncertainty in the world, you know, especially in the especially the rise of the idea of nationalisms, which uh, also you know, arises in you know many places, you know, including uh, the uh, the the struggles you know, in India, you know, from you know the British uh, administrations, and also. Uh, the struggles in China and also in Southeast Asia. So I think uh, the main reasons that you know he delivered you know, this talk you know, in Bangkok, uh, because uh, you know I think uh, what well, he saw you know something, yeah, something in you know in ba in Bangkok or in, in in Thailand, you know that could uh, act as you know, a breeding ground for a new way of thinking, you know, about you know trans cultural and transnational, you know, uh, interactions. During his visit, you know, he, um, you know, he has you know addressed you know many uh, people in many places, you know, including uh, uh, the the national museums and and you know, the national libraries during that times, uh, and also. 
uh, interestingly, you know, he also visited you know, the Chinese school in Bangkok, the, the schools that uh, primarily uh, taught you know, in Chinese you know, for the overseas Chinese communities in Bangkok. And also uh, the, 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 the photo, the big, uh, the, the big photos that was taken in, at my university, you know, Chula Longkorn University, where he also addressed uh, a congregations of students and, 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 and the scholars you know, to, uh, at our university on you know, the ideal of education. And also you know, his visit you know, has drawn a large number of you know, Indian you know, diasporas crowd uh, in Thailand or in Siam Sungai that times, uh, you know, which you can see that they are, you know, comes from you know, different regions in, in India and, you know, from, and also you know, from uh, different uh, you know, cultural backgrounds. You know, for example, uh, Mr. Nandalal, you know, who, uh, who was you know, the, the uh, sort of you know, the leader of the Indian communities you know, here in Bangkok during that times, and also you know, the large uh, congregations of the Zeek uh, you know, who, were, uh, who, was, who were living in Thailand during that times. And also, interestingly, uh, the person you know, who introduced you know, Rapintra Tagore you know, to, uh, to the Thai audience uh, you know, was uh, a Parsi, you know, one, one of the very few Parsi in, in Thailand, so Mr. Pestanji uh, uh, during that time. So you, know, you can see you know, the diversities of the Indian communities here in Bangkok. Uh, in, Thai, in Siam, so in Bangkok, uh, he gave you know five you know, lectures you know, to uh, to you know, different groups of people. Uh, you know, for example, you know, for the Indian uh, during the Indian receptions, where uh, a lot of you know, Indian diasporas living in Bangkok you know, gathered. You know, he gave a talks on Indians' roles in the world, which you know, trying to uh, to you know, to you know, give them some idea you know, about how India's or the Indians you know, should play you know, in, in the world. And at Chulalongkorn University, you know, he was primarily talking about you know, child educations. And you know, for the Chinese receptions, you know, he was talking about you know, the, you know, what it means to be you know, Chinese and, you know, and how China and India you know, can come you know, together you know, to, uh, to create you know, something that is, uh, would be a great contribution to the world. And, oh, I'm sorry my, for, for my typos. Um, and, uh, and, you know, for, and for the king and the queens and also you know, the royal dignitaries at the Sid Palace, you know, he was talking about uh, Asia's continental cultures, you know, which focusing on the ideas of uh, Interact, uh, inter exchange you know, between uh, the East and the West, and also uh, the idea of you know, the pan Asian cultures. You know, he was seeing something you know, in Thailand as a meeting point you know, between uh, China uh, and you know, Indian Chinese and Indian cultures. And at the National Museums, you know, he also, you know, again, you know, he gave you know, the, uh, a talk on. Uh, the ideals of national educations, which you know, primarily uh, uh, models on his you know, philosophy and thoughts on educations uh, at, you know, at, at Shanti Niketan. From his visit, you know, I think uh, there are well, there are many ideas you know, that you know, has been influentials you know, in Thailand ever since. Uh, one of the ideas that you know, he gave, and you know, I think you know, stick to the, the Thai consciousness, uh, uh, is you know, the idea of uh, the friendships and the international, or in, uh, international cooperation between China and India. Now, on, you know, three years earlier, you know, he went to China and you know, gave a talk to uh, a group of you know, Chinese in in Shanghai, I guess, um, 
and that and uh, he, 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 was think, uh, he was talking about the friendships between China and India are the foundation stone of you know, the struggling Asia. And again, you know, he, he came to Bangkok in 1927. You know, he, you know, he was talking you know, to uh, the overseas Chinese populations in Bangkok, you know, which, uh, is more, which were you know, more Thai than Chinese, but again, uh, and that he was you know, expressing you know, similar ideas that you know, I have hoped that China and India will draw closer in, in a spiritual and cultural, to create a spiritual and cultural unity, which is the best that we can share and contribute to the world. And uh, I think you know, that this is uh, something uh, that you know, Thailand and you know, science has taken on you know quite seriously you know about that you know we don't you know see uh you know, china and india as you know conflicting you know but you know we see them you know as you know, to great power uh in terms you know of the power of you know ideas you know, and cultural powers you know and you know that you know that you know if that if they can come together and you know, it would be able you know to create you know something great in the world mm -hmm. And uh, before he left Bangkok, mm -hmm, uh, Rupintra Tagore also you know, wrote a poem uh, to uh, the Thai populations, and especially you know, the, the king and the queen. Uh, it's, it, was, it, it is called To Siam, and it was read you know, before the king and the queen of Siam's at the palace on uh, the very last day of his stay in Bangkok, and you know, first in Bengali and <clears throat> and then uh, in English. Uh, uh, in this poems, uh, the what Tagore it shows you know, Tagore as appre uh, appreciations of the presence of Indian culture in science, which has been you know very well preserved. And Back then, you know, he compares you know, in what India is to a deserted shrine, you know, whereas Siam was still the shelter of endless glories of India. You know. So I think you know, he was just you know, uh, you know, trying to be polite and to, trying to you know, make the king and the queen you know, feel good you know, about, you know, about you know, their countries. But uh, I think that the underlying point mm -hmm, is uh, of you know of these poems is you know that uh, you know, actually, uh, is that you know, in Asia you know, we can you know still you know, you know, we can still share and we can we can still you know build you know a culture a pan you know, a pan Asian culture so that is the amalgamations you know of you know, different you know, uh, uh, different cultures and you know different areas. Uh, yeah, you know, either you know, you know, when, you know whether it's, it's India, you know, Chinese, uh, Siamese, you know, Malay, uh, and that you know that you know would come you know together in in in, in, in the forms of uh, a mongrel you know, that we are you know in Thailand, mm -hmm. and you know, from that you know visit you know, a few years you know later a few a few a few years after you know, that visit. Uh, Rapindra Tagore and also you know, sent uh, a Bengali scholars. Uh, uh, his name you know, was uh, Bandit Prafula Kumar Sen, uh, uh, who is known in Thailand in, as uh, Swami Shatyanand Taburi. Uh, he was a Bengali you know, and he came to live in Thailand in order to, uh, to, to teach uh, the, uh, the Siamese and the Thai, you know, uh, about, you know, the Indian uh, cultures and also uh, uh, in, in Sanskrit and also Hindi. And, uh, but uh, at the end, you know, he, you know, because, you know, he was such a very, uh, a very good scholar and, you know, he started to learn Thai and, uh, and, has, and has become, you know, very, uh, uh, proficient you know, in Thai, so he wrote you know, a number of books, you know, on, also you know about the uh, the 
uh, the <clears throat> the well, the ancient the Indian uh, literatures, and also he translated uh, a lot of you know Vedic, and also uh, wrote uh, a series you know of you know book that you know we in Thailand you know still you know considered you know, to be uh, to be a very foundations of uh, of you know, university educations, you know, especially in my field. Uh, in terms of you know rhetorics, you know, speech communications, and also in uh, in cultural studies, and uh, <clears throat> um, you know, but you know, if, if if you are interested, you know, in you know the 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 uh, the the links you know, between you know from since Rabin Tratagore uh, uh, to Swami Satyanand Taburi, and also in uh, to Netaji Supas Chandra Bose. Uh, uh, there is a very good book uh, that has been published uh, at the uh, Indian Study Center of Jalalongkorn University, and it's called uh, Sayam Parat Relations. You know, but uh, it is now only in Thai, but you know, we are working on uh, translating this book uh, into uh, English. Uh, and lastly, hmm, I think uh, the ideas that, you know, the topical idea that has made you know, a very uh, prominent imprint you know, on the Thai mind most was you know, his idea of education, you know, especially Shanti Niketan and Sri Niketan, about, uh, and you know, his philosophy of uh, uh, education you know, that, that would draw a child or a human being a cl much closer to natures and much closer to the communities and how the uh, the educations and the idea of learning that you know, should serve uh, the communities and building a person who are a, a person who is a part of the natures, the environments, and you know, the larger you know, existence you know, in the universe. So uh, from you know, his idea of the school under the trees, you know, which you know, in Thai, it's Royan uh, Thai Romai, and you know, we still call, uh, we still refer to Santi Neketan as you know, the school under the trees. And uh, it has, you know, this, this idea you know, has uh, created you know, a series of the schools in you know, different parts of Thailand, which uh, try to uh, provide you know the alternatives you know, to a very rigid uh, uh, European westernized uh, education systems you know, that we have, and trying to focus on you know, the, uh, the development of the children's and also on free thought and also the interchange between the heart and the mind you know, and the body. Hmm. Okay, and I think you know, this is you know, the end of my, uh, my presentations and my talk. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy that this online seminar is connecting East and West and through India, Tagore in India. And I'm thankful that Dr. Jarayuth, uh, a wonderful multidimensional scholar from the East and Dr. Ananya Mukherjee from Canada are here. It's also a great coincidence that we have Dr. Jarayuth and I'm so happy he spoke about Tagore's visit to Siam. If any of you visit Chodalankan University, you can still feel the spirit of Rabindranath Tagore, Prafula Chandra Sen, and Subhash Chandra Bose. Because Subhash Chandra Bose used the campus for his freedom speech and the king allowed him to do it because they were so supportive of our freedom struggle. And uh, Dr. Jaredu has already spoken about the lectures that uh, Tagore gave when he was in Siam. And uh, Prafula Chandra Sen was sent uh, to Chulalankorn because the king requested Rabindra Tagore to send a Sanskrit scholar and he sent the preeminent scholar, as Jarayudha said, to teach Sanskrit. And we must know that Sanskrit is being taught in Churulankan for over 100 years now, as also Hindi. 
It's one of very good Sanskrit department. That was the contribution of Tagore. And uh, of course, Dr. Tirayu, we did not mention his CV. He was worked on film and his, uh, uh, he presented a very good paper at the 150th uh, commemoration of Tagore's centenary, birth centenary called Tagore Through the Lens, a reading of Satyajit Satyaji Ray's documentary and film renditions of Tagore. I hope he'll make the paper available to the scholars and teachers present here because that will give you a different view of Tagore. I will come to how unfortunately Tagore has been distorted in our country and very unfortunately by literature teachers. I'm also happy that Dr. Adanya Mukherjee is here because she is really the Tagore scholar. We are all people who wandered into the domain of Tagore because of various circumstances, but are benefited by this wandering because I don't think there is any philosopher or any religious teacher who can give as much to a person in life than Tagore. Uh, I always tell my PhD students and other students to read Tagore's Religion of Man, also called Religion of Forest. And if they need it, they don't need any Swamiji's, Guruji's and priests and others. I'm happy the Ananya is here because other than being a Tagore scholar, she possibly is the only person who's read Tagore in the original Bengali and makes a big difference. His collected works in Bengali extend to about 26 volumes, if I remember correctly. And they, of course, he's untranslatable, as many translators, eminent translators say, which is why he himself translated himself. And his writings in English and his translations in the original have been published by Shaiti Academy in four volumes. For whatever reason, volume two is not available, but that itself runs to thousands of pages. So it's, and the other interesting coincidence that uh, uh, Dr. Ananya Mukherjee is here is, she's from British Columbia where Tagore visited in 1929 to address a conference of the National Council of, Can National Council of Education of Canada, where he spoke of freedom, creativity and leisure in education. It will be interesting for all our educators present in this online seminar to reflect many of the words that Tavor referred to in a speech in Canada, freedom, creativity and leisure, if at all they are, have any resonance in any of our campuses. And it may be a good way to also un examine our consciences. So we have fortunately East and West, but let me not stray away from the focus of our discussion on Tagore as nature's philosopher. Tagore has come to us largely in his English writings, but there have been great translators and I rely, of course, on only his English writings. Unfortunately, it was too late for me to learn Bengali. Uh, among them, one of the greatest translators other than uh, Keteki Tushari Dyson is William Radis. So I largely depend on William Radis's work, his book called Selected Poems, which I really think every one of you should own a copy and read it whenever you would like to read something wonderful, beautiful, when you are melancholy, when you are sad, when you are happy, because all the moods are there. And in that collection, Selected Poems we have William Radis, who is now at the School for African Asian Studies in London, there are several poems related to nature. Since this is not a lecture on Tagore on nature, there than a lecture on Tagore on, on his, on a, as a philosopher, we are not going into his nature writings. In my view of Tagore as a nature philosopher, I see him also as somebody who's contributed as an epistemologist and an epistemology of nature and philosophy. Of course, he did not himself write much about it. Amartya Sen writes in his writings about Tagore's unique contribution in, in this area. I'm aware as I'm teaching, as I'm uh, talking and uh, talking about epistemology, that there are some small young children, thanks to the president of my college, engineering college alumni association, Vidya, there are even 10 year old, 14 year old kids attending the seminar. So I shall not be too pedantic and go into all, that, all of that because Tagore himself was a precocious child. And whatever he did in the books he wrote, that a lot for children, he always tried to reach out and unearth this precociousness in children. And you know, a world of fantasy. 
uh, Sudhir Kakkar in his beautiful, unique biography called Young Tagore, Makings of a Genius, um, which I will show the cover later on, which is also a book worth reading. He quotes from Tagore, from Tagore's Crescent Moon, The Beginnings, something again we should give to our students and others to read, where, Ta where he quotes Tagore saying, that imagination and one of its chief products is fantasy, which has been called vehicle of hope, healer of trauma, protector from reality. In current world, in the current world today, we are all sitting phys physically distancing ourselves. I don't like to say social distancing. It has other connotations in India. When we're all physically distancing ourselves and children have to learn online and so on, I think it's important to somehow see how we can give them such writings of, of Tagore like Crescent Moon and, and see how this, 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 it can be a vehicle of hope, a healer of trauma, healer of trauma, particularly in this situation. And an even worse artificial school atmosphere going through these online teaching and so forth. So even more divorced from nature. Of course, as I already mentioned, Tagore, uh, not all are literature teachers, but by and large are literature teachers. I've also done a disservice to Tagore because I've seen him fundamentally as a poet and unfortunately worse, like some romantic poet. Also, he had that kind of, uh, you know, appearance. So he, he projected it in, in a sense himself, but uh, and, uh, there are several people who write about this comparing him to Wordsworth. Of course, there are a lot of nice, in, interesting comparisons to Wordsworth. But Tagore is more than, I mean, I won't say more or whatever, don't want to get into these comparisons. But he was, just, he was not just another nature poet. Tagore's cre his creativity, his innovation, in his prose, in his writings, in his poetry, his drama, his music, was driven by seeing nature. This is something that we should understand. He was an extraordinary innovator as an educator, as a writer, as a painter, as a poet. To him, nature was also not something apart from society, apart from culture. He saw it in an integrated sense. He saw nature, culture, we can also call it ecology, and society where it's part of his philosophy of nature. One must remember in this context that his thinking about nature and sustainability was also in the context of India's freedom struggle. Today, it seems so distant. When we celebrate 75th anniversary, I'm not sure we will recall the discussions that happened in India at that time on sustainability at that point, where Gandhi and Tagore, even though they differed about which I shall come to, talked of a notion of modernity, which includes the notion of sustainability. It was because of that we have uh, people like uh, Gandhi's economist, J.C. Kumarapa, who then wrote the book, The Economy of Permanence. You can say it was perhaps one of the first works on sustainability. And it is in the context of the discussions, the contributions of Tagore uh, that, we, that these works also came out and it also influenced our constitution very much. It was Tagore's uh, influence other than the um, national anthem in which we celebrate the nature of the fantastic diversity and culture and nature of our country we must also remember that the part four of the constitution, direct to principles of state policy, which might be good to send in postcards to all our leaders in nationally and in the states, which says direct, the direct to principles of state policy, article 48A, dealing with protection and improvement of the environment and safeguarding of forests and wildlife, dealing with the fundamental duties, wherein one of the fundamental duties of every citizen was to protect and improve the natural environment, not destroy it. Improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife. And I underline this sentence, to have compassion for living creatures. This notion of compassion comes from, of course, our Buddhist heritage, but also from uh, Tagore. It is, it is in this sense, Tagore's contribution has been great to our society, connecting nature and society. And in connecting nature and society, he also, of course, in, uh, since children are here, I want to say 
I just don't want to be talking of Tagore as such a serious person. He also wrote very ironic, witty, humorous pieces, both as haiku and in, uh, you know, like questioning. For example, this in this poem, Question, he, he writes, God, again and again, through the ages, you have sent messengers to this pitiless world. They have said, forgive everyone. They have said, love one another, rid your hearts of evil. They are revered and remembered. Yet still in these dark days, we turn them away with hollow greetings from outside the doors of our houses. And meanwhile, I see secretive hatred, secretive hatred, murdering the helpless under cover of night and justice weeping silently and furtively at power misused. No hope of redress. I see young men working themselves into a frenzy in agony, dashing their heads against stone to no avail. My voice, my voice is choked today. I have no music in my flute. Black moonless night has imprisoned my world, plunged it into nightmare. And this is why with tears in my eyes, I ask those who have poisoned your air, those who have extinguished, extinguished your light, can it be that you have forgiven them? Can it be that you love them? So this is one poem in which he connects both nature and uh, society. And I could go on. I'm largely drawing on my paper that I presented at uh, the Tagore 150th uh, commemoration seminar in Chulalongkorn, uh, which was very interestingly called uh, Tag uh, Towards Human Solidarity Beyond Nationalism. So when we talk of society, nature and society, we cannot, of course, lose nation. What is this nation? Tago asked this question, what is this nation? And he says, a nation in the political and economic union of a people is that aspect which a whole population assumes when organized for a mechanical purpose. Society has no such ulterior pur purpose, he says. Nation has. Society has an end in itself. It is a spontaneous self-expression of man as social being. But when with the help of science, and the perfecting of this organization of power, nation, begins to grow and brings in harvest of wealth, then it crosses boundaries with amazing rapidity. For then it goads all its neighboring societies with greed of material prosperity and consequent mutual jealousy. And by the fear of each other's growth into powerlessness. That is why, that is the world in which we are today. And I'm happy that uh, Jirayu talked about India and China and so on. Because today we have unbelievable national competition, unbelievable nationalism that even Tagore would not have ever imagined in his life that this would happen. The time comes when it can stop no longer for the competition grows keener, organization grows vaster and selfishness attains supremacy. Trading upon the greed and fear of man, it occupies more and more space in society. And at last, it becomes its ruling force, which you can reflect in the India we are today. When a society allows itself to be changed into a perfect organization of power, then there are few crimes which it is unable to perpetrate. Personal man becomes eliminated to a phantom. Everything becomes a result of policy carried out by the human parts of a machine with no twinge of pity or moral responsibility. I think it will be good to reflect on Tagore in this fashion. So, so he was very, very, very clear that society and nation were connected, that nature and society were connected. But society was being, uh, in a sense, suffocated by nation. And we can't see it in a way in India today, society being suffocated by nation. And for him, nature also meant uh, a, a spiritual, uh, inspirational uh, part in which it was not something outside there. He saw it with culture because he says, the ideal of perfection preached by the forest dwellers of ancient India runs through the heart of our classical literature and still dominates our mind. Here he's making a distinction between the Western attitude to nature and the Asian, I would say Asian, non-Western because 
it would be too arrogant to say Indian. Tagore himself did not mean it in that sense. He says that he sees the difference. To the West, it always appeared as a dualism. To the East, it appeared in unity. Even when he, in the religion of the forest, in, um, in religion of man, when he talks of the Ramayana, he poetically places the intimate relationship between human and nature with reference to Rama and Sita. In the Ramayana, Rama and, and he says, he read, let me read from him. In the Ramayana, Rama and his companions, in their banishment, had to traverse forest after forest. In the Ramayana, Ramayana we led to realize the greatness of the hero, not in a fierce struggle with nature, but in sympathy with it. Sita, the daughter-in-law of a greatly king, kingly house, goes along the forest path. We read, she asks Rama about the flowering trees and shrubs and creepers, which she has not seen before. At her request, Lakshmana gathers and brings her plants of all kinds, exuberant with flowers, and it delights her heart to see the forest rivers variegated with their streams and sandy banks, resounding with the call of heron and duck. Having lived on that hill for long, Rama, who was Girivana Priya, lover of the mountain and forest, said one day to Sita, when I look upon the beauties of this hill, the loss of my kingdom troubles me no, no, no longer, nor does the separation from my friends cause me any pang. Thus passed Ramachandra's exile, now in woodland, now in hermitage. The love which Rama and Sita bore to each other united them, not only to each other, but to the universe of life. That is why when Sita was taken away, the loss seemed to be so great to the forest itself. I would only add, if you lose all our forests, wonder where Rama and Sita will go. But that's for you to reflect. So, the, but when I, this passage I read, you can also see his deep appreciation of ecological diversity. His deep appreciation of the ecological diversity of, of nature. Not only in a sense of species diversity, but also ecosystem diversity. So as a philosopher, he stands for all times. Sometimes when we think of great names, we try to say, oh, they are relevant today, as if they were not relevant yesterday, or they are not relevant tomorrow. They are relevant today to us. I'll read in 2008, so prescient, UNESCO Executive Committee passed a resolution to commemorate the birth centenaries of Tago, Neruda, and Aimee Caesar, three poets from three continents. Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And referring to Tagore, UNESCO went on to say, Rabindranath Tagore saw nature and culture as intimately linked. At one level, he considered culture as a physical response to the beauty of nature, and yet another as the emotional or spiritual one. His view of nature as a permanent creative movement reflected his cultural background. UNESCO goes on to say in that revolution, in that resolution, Tagore foresaw the gravity of the ecological issues being prepared for the world. This is to 2008, referring to Tagore 150 years ago. Tagore foresaw the gravity of the ecological issues being prepared for the world, where the arrogance of human beings and the frantic search for profit were proliferating in a predatory sense. That sacrifice some people showed contempt for nature and was storing up destruction. If this, if this describes any countries that we know of, please reflect for yourself. UNESCO then said, based on such a clear vision of ecology and the environment, this had a central place in his writing. Tago's discourse is full of references to planet Earth and its flora as to the vast universe and its, and its stars. In his poetry, he constantly refers to humanity's bond with nature. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so you can see the appreciation that Tagore had elsewhere also. And, uh, you know, I, I talked about Tagore being reduced to a nature poet than being seen as a philosopher. And Sisir Kumar Das, in his introduction to the Sahitya Academy Collections of Writings, says that uh, it is necessary to remember that the prophet image which fitted uh, Tagore so nicely was essentially a Western construction. Tagore's con own contribution to it withstanding, 
which did not care in the least to differentiate him from stereotypes. So we have to go beyond Tagore's stereotypes as poet of nature and as some um, yogic philosopher. The most important thing, Chishir Kumar Sahar says, and I want to emphasize it, that went totally unnoticed was Tagore's foregrounding of folk religion. His translations of Kabir and Nyanadas Bageli had deep connect, deeper connections with his understandings of religion, received, which received no less support from the Bauls, the wandering singers of Bengal, the subalterns of Indian religious history, as it did from the sophisticated Upasani Upanishad texts, which sustained the Brahmo ideology. This recognition of a folk world view resistant to canonical texts and institutions provided a fuller picture of religious plurality, the coexistence of religious sects, distinctive by social stratification, Brahminical and non-Brahminical elite and folk as well. Though later Tagore in a letter to one of his friends actually renounces this also, which I'll come to. Tagore's, Tagore himself said in his talking of the Baal singers and their deep spirituality, he wrote, from wandering village singers who have no images, no temples underlined, no temples, scriptures or ceremonials, who declare in the songs the divinity of man and express for him an intense feeling of love coming from men who are unsophisticated, living a simple life in obscurity. It gives us a clue to the inner meaning of all religions. For it suggests these religions are never about the God of cosmic force, but about the God of a human personality. Uh, I remember the, Dr. Wude once invited me to speak at the Brahmo Samaj. Uh, I'm thankful to him because that also made me work on Tagore. I titled my lecture, uh, Religion as Inhuman Culture, borrowing a Tunisian philosopher, Hele Biji. Because why Tagore talks about moving away from established religion and going towards nature and making it your philosophy was because the way religions also operated. And today you can see the root, ruthlessness and the kind of fierceness with which religions operate. Then the other question of Tagore, was he somebody who was apolitical? Literary scholars, so in such a banal way, right, saying Tagore was an apolitical person. But this is what Tagore wrote to William Rothstein. William Rothstein appreciated his writings and poetry so much. He was worried that if Tagore engages in this conflict with the nationalists of India and their militantism and so on, that uh, he will lose his creative uh, force. So Tagore wrote this to William Rothstein. He says, I have nothing to do directly with politics. I'm not a nationalist, moderate or immoderate in my uh, political aspirations. But politics is not a mere abstraction. It has its personality and it does intrude into my life when I'm human. It kills and maims individuals. It tells lies. It uses its sacred sword of justice for the purpose of massacre. It spreads misery, broadcast over centuries of exploitation. And I cannot say to myself, poet, you have nothing to do with these facts for they belong to politics. This politics, Tagore says, assumes its fullest diabolical aspect when I find in all its hideous acts of injustice, find moral support from a whole nation only because it wants to enjoy in comfort and safety the golden fruits reaped from the abject degradation of human races. I think we should remember those of us in our comfortable middle-class homes that when our forests are destroyed, when our tribals are displaced, our comfort and safety, as Tagore says, the comfort and safety, the golden fruits that we enjoy are reaped from the abject degradation of human, resource, human races. And this we call nation. This we want to be proud about. So, so he says, finally he says in his call to humanity, of course in his seminal work, nationalism, and it'll be interesting for our Indian friends here, maybe our other international friends also, that Tagore's nationalism has been translated into Thai and was one among the most popular literature read uh, in recent times. Jeroit perhaps will say about it later on, but, and uh, I mean, Chulalankan called for a meeting of the 
translators to translate Tagore. As an aside, I just want to tell you, uh, 35 people registered. I was there at that time. 235 people came for the meeting on translating Tagore. That's the kind of interest Tagore has outside. And we have something to do in our country. And this is a great debt we have to do to Tagore, to the country, to society, and to our students. Otherwise, we have completely failed in our effort. So he says, so finally he says in nationalism, let our life be simple in the outer aspect and rich in its inner gain. Let our civilization take its firm stand upon its basis of social cooperation and not upon that of economic exploitation and conflict. How to do it in the teeth of the drainage of our lifeblood by the economic dragons is the task set before the thinkers of all Asian nations who have faith in the human soul. And then he appeals to the dreamers of the East and West to keep our faith in life that creates and not in the machine that constructs, in the power that hides its force and blossoms in beauty, not the power that bears its arms and chuckles at its capacity to make itself obnoxious. Let us know that the machine is good when it helps, but not so when it exploits life. The science is great when it destroys evil, but not when the two enter into an unholy alliance. So let me kind of come to an end. I have much to say that um, I think uh, all I'm trying to talk is that Tagore should be remembered in the sense as a philosopher who can mean something to us. Philosophers are normally read as great texts. Yes, that's also true. Tagore also can be read into his great texts. Any time of the day, any time of the moment of your life, you can take up if you have good. Now, of course, his works are available online. There is no copyright on it. Colleges should be printing small books like Chris and Poon and others and distributing them free to, to, to actually acculturize our citizens, to make them better citizens to make them capable of being citizens of a society before being citizens of a nation. And uh, since my young friends are also here and I kept saying that uh, Tagore also wrote witty, ironic, I mean, witty, humorous poems, which I'm sure their mentors like Vidya can read for them. I want to finish by a dialogue that he wrote between a peacock and, uh, and a tailor bird. He wrote a lot of poetry on birds, on earthworms. He matter of fact in Muk uh, Mukatara, that famous play, which is about the first dam built in India in 1922. And the people who agitated against the dam were arrested by the British. Any connections to today? Think about it. There he actually talks of the, the conflict between the young man and his father, where the young man, the, the older man is so fascinated with his yantra and they, and they praise the yantra and so on. And this boy finally dies by making a hole in the dam. You go and read the, read the novel. But let me read this final, uh, this poetry, because peacocks also are everywhere now. The tailor bird said, Mr. Tailor bird is making fun of the peacock. The poetry, title of the poetry is called Glory's Burden. Tailor bird said, oh peacock, I feel such pity for you when I see your tail, said the peacock. Really? Please tell me why. Seeing me brings a tear to your eye? Taylor Bird said, it looks so funny. Your tail is much greater in size than your body. Just watch how I dart lightly about. Your tail must be such a burdensome weight. Then the peacock said, don't, said, said the peacock. Grieve for me falsely. And this line is important. Burdens must rest on those who have glory. So the peacock has glory, but it also has a burden. So let's, let, I, let me hope that uh, through the seminar that we have done and the large number of people are attended, that this can be an occasion to bring back Tagore because we'll tend to may forget him, uh, particularly when we come to the 150th anniversary of uh, uh, Gandhi's home. It's very important to celebrate Gandhi, but also remember the, the kind of dialogue that Gandhi and Tagore had. Tagore uh, disagreed or dissented with uh, Gandhi 
on the fact that it was more important to change society than change nation. And I think he was right. He was prophetic. He told, uh, he told Gandhi, today you're fighting against what you call a foreign force, but tomorrow somebody else will come in your own color and be as foreign to you. I'm not going to read the whole quote. And therefore, I think in remembering, we must remember Tagore when we remember Gandhi, that it is not enough to celebrate Gandhi and what Gandhi gave to us in our freedom as a nation, but there is no nation if there is no society. And that must be remembered, whatever. And, and uh, one, one last part that I want to say, I've been reading some poetries. I also wanted to read his poem on Africa, which he wrote when Mussolini invaded Africa because of his deep love for indigenous people, tribals, and so forth. Uh, I'm not going to take time to, I don't want to take more time. I'm also thinking it's a borrowed idea from French television. French television has launched a program on reading loud French literature. I think those of you who are here should get your children, school children, teachers, and others to read passages from Tagore. And in the age of this modern age of the phone and the movie camera, record your what you read loud and send it to our leaders, our prime minister, our environment minister, our environment secretary, our chief minister, because when they thoughtlessly destroy forests, to want in Karnataka, we want to do a red line between Hubali and Ankola. What we don't realize is that this very virus that we are living with is a result of the destruction of forests, because forest is not about trees. It's about the huge, fantastic web of ecology that's below the earth. And when you uproot forests, when you uproot the earth, you're letting into the earth, the atmosphere, viruses we've never known before. Now this is being beautifully recorded by the Scientific American, by National Geographic, you can read it. And therefore there is this connection. And this connection should come through us by our greatest philosopher that we gave to the world but we have forgotten him in our own country, Ramidranath Tagore. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Dr. Satish, in my enthusiasm, I went beyond your time limit. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. And it was so enlightening to hear um, my predecessors. So I'll start just with the, um, an anecdote. I think uh, Lawrence mentioned Tagore's visit to Canada. Uh, when he finally came, that was actually after refusing the invitation to come to Canada for several times. And he refused it as a protest in, uh, uh, against the way the Canadian government treated Sikh immigrants. So a ship called Komagata Maru had uh, come to uh, Canada carrying Sikh immigrants and they were not allowed to land because at that time there was a lot of uh, racism against immigrants who were not white. And so there was a lot of death, destruction, illness amongst the Sikh immigrants. And as a result of that, uh, Tagore thought he should protest by not coming to Canada. And in the end, when he came, he gave his final speech before leaving Canada in a Gurdwara. And one of the things that he said is that Canada has to solve many problems of which the most important one is racism. And how um, prophetic that was, he wrote a lot about how he saw racism in the US and then in Canada, um, uh, about the need for um, addressing race. Uh, but I don't want to digress from today's topic. I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, a lot of the things that um, uh, Lawrence already mentioned about Tagore's philosophy. So I'm not going to talk so much about Tagore the poet and the nature lover because um, we know that part of him. To me, he really is a philosopher of justice and his thinking about nature is on those questions of justice. Of course, the lover of nature, the poet doesn't go away. He's always there. I'll bring him back at the beginning. But let me just first um, uh, talk a little bit about his thoughts on nature. So he uh, 
was already anticipating the long-term negative impact of industrialization which he was witnessing. And this was not because of industrialization itself. He was not against industry or science or progress or anything like that. But he was deeply concerned about the context of colonialism in which this industrialization take, was taking place. And what he thought was human greed was the most important driving force behind the kind of industrialization that he was witnessing. And there are two processes that he wrote extensively about. Uh, one was deforestation, and the second one was the uh, destruction of rural society and economy. And both were associated with industrialization and urbanization of that time. So let me just start with a poem. It's a very famous poem, which is called the Ode to Civilization. Shobhotar Pruti is the Bengali title. It's just four lines I will read for you. Give me back the wilderness, take away the city, take away your steel, your brick and stone walls, O oh, newfangled civilization. Let me have my freedom, the spread of my wings. Give me back the strength that I once had. Let me feel, the soul, feel in my soul the heartbeat of this endless universe. In many of his writings, this idea of destruction of the human soul is seen as coupled with the destruction of nature. And in particular, he speaks of trees and forests with a kind of imagery that is very compelling. So initially, when I was preparing for this, I thought I'd read from his essay, a couple of essays. But now that I know that there are some children in our audience, I just want to tell you a little bit about a short story that Tagore wrote about a little boy called Bolai. And uh, this is what he says about Bolai. Bolai loved trees. Whenever anybody was cutting any trees, he would say, please do not cut it off. And he would plead to, for, um, for everybody to stop the cutting of trees. And this is what Tagore says about the little boy. It says, Bolai had come to understand that there were some sorrows that only he could feel. Nobody else could understand them. It seems that the boy was born hundreds of millions of years ago, the same day that the forests cried out in pain for the first time. The trees, the pioneers of life on earth, looked up to the sun and said, let me endure, let me live. I can overcome countless deaths and still travel towards the opening up of life be it rain or shine or day or night. We can hear those words even today where the forests cry out and say, I live, I will continue to live, let me live. They continue to protect the life force, the beauty and the inspiration that is necessary to sustain this world. And it was as if Bolai, the little boy, could hear that voice of the forest and nobody could. And this is why he was so, Bolai was so protective of the trees. And this idea of protecting the forests um, was very important when Tagore started his work on uh, in Shantiniketan and Sriniketan. And there he started two festivals. Uh, one was called Holokorshon, the tilling of the land. And the other one was called Brikkuropon, which was a uh, planting of trees. And um, every time those festivals would happen, he um, uh, wrote an essay, and I'll read you just a little bit from um, a couple of these essays. Uh, he says that, you know, just as, as Bolai said, that we have not heard the pain of the forests and we have destroyed them. So today we will remember those times preceding the industrial age, which was the agrarian age. At that moment, the earth served her children the nourishment that catered to their physical and spiritual need. That was not the age of gross surpluses and ugly human greed. 
He then says in, in another essay um, around those festivals, the time now has come for us to repent. That is why today's celebrations have two aspects. The first is to begin the tilling of land. We till to grow our food for our sustenance, not for greed. The second is to plant trees. As we take from nature for our sustenance, we should continuously give back. And at that time, he's already writing about the cities in, in India which are being um, uh, desertified. There is uh, natural calamities, there is cyclone. And he already has a global view that this is happening in the US, this is happening in India. And he's uh, giving a cautionary note. But most importantly, through his work in uh, Shantiniketan and Sriniketan, he's actually trying to create that understanding that nature must be replenished, that we cannot keep um, greedily taking from nature. The other uh, very important aspect of thought um, around a sustainability is um, Tagore's essays on the decimation of rural life. And he wrote a, a number of essays called The Neglected Villages around 1934. And at that time, not only is he writing about urbanization and decimation of the villages, but he's talking about how the agrarian economy is causing the destruction of millions and making a few people very, very wealthy and making a lot of people uh, creating a lot of hardship for a lot of people. And he calls this a civilizational uh, crisis. He calls this a civilization based on inequality. So this is a quote from one of his writings in the neglected villages. In the villages, millions are toiling to produce food. Wealth, on the other hand, is being produced by a few in the cities. This deliberate disconnection between the production of food and the production of wealth is engendering the greatest possible divide between people. A civilization that grows within such a divide cannot last for long. And when I hear today about the crisis around livelihoods of people who produce food, these words ring so true. In the similar essay, he's, uh, in the same essay, actually, he's writing, today our villages are half dead. If we imagine that we can just continue to live, then that would be a mistake. For the dying can pull the living only towards death. The plight of rural India that Tagore describes appears amazingly prophetic when we view against today's reality. Between 1915 and 1940, he wrote extensively on what he saw as the deepening rural predicament. By this time, a more fundamental rupture was occurring between the city and the village, between the agrarian economy and the industrial economy. And he observes again that the production of food is artificially separated from the production of wealth. As a result, the producers of food were being completely marginalized, even though they performed the most important function in society. They had no economic and political power. Even their once abundant cultural wealth was now destroyed by their struggles for survival. And I think, you know, the, the understanding of the folk literature, folk art, is actually, it's not only Tagore's appreciation of art, but it's also his concern that this whole group of people would be, um, uh, were being decimated and he was really concerned about that. Uh, he did not expect uh, independence to automatically solve these problems. And I think, you know, uh, what we heard uh, just before me from uh, Lawrence around the question of nation, about what kind of nation we were going to build, that was a big concern in Tagore, which is why he did not think that the decimation of the rural economy will be addressed um, just through independence. So he lamented 
uh, in anticipation about the independent India that was being fashioned by what he thought was an urbanized, English educated, prosperous middle class riding on the head, what he called the heady sense of nationalism and progress. He feared an even faster decimation of the rural economy and a complete marginalization of what he called the real India, uh, which would have no space in an elite framework of development. And we see, you know, a, a, a lot of this divide um, between uh, the different uh, social classes, they, they are um, uh, wider today than uh, in some ways than, than ever before, inequality is uh, rising everywhere. Um, and even with the pandemic, we see such a disproportionate impact on different groups of people. So this idea of um, the rural economy close to nature, where one would live in um, a relationship with nature that would um, sustain social solidarity, solidarity uh, with nature, and solidarity with the agrarian uh, economy. That was really the basis of his work in Sriniketan and Shantaniketan. And I think there's a lot of need to continue uh, that kind of work, which is not only about village development, but about really the livelihoods of millions and millions of people. And he was an eternal optimist and the believer in the endlessness in life. It was, that was a thought he derived from nature. So even when he saw this decimation, this destruction, he had said on many different occasions that it is a sin to lose faith in humanity. This was his famous last lecture called The Crisis of Civilization, where he says that I have lost my faith in Western civilization as I had, but I think it is now from the East that some um, greatness will emerge and I'm not gonna lose my faith in humanity because that is a sin. So I want to end with just one uh, poem. It's actually a very famous song, which where Tagore expresses this endlessness of nature, uh, where we continue to do our work and there is really no end because nature is vast and endless. Through tears and laughter, through winter and spring, that my music must go on forever. Is this your wish? Is this why you send to me your unending gift of songs? Is this your wish that I am dreamy eyed no more? My mind is set free as if a wild wind has touched the endless pains I have known for so long. Between night and day, between light and darkness, my world erupts in a beautiful turmoil. An endless disquiet strums incessantly at my soul as if on a harp. It ignites me and I burn as I strive to make my music. Is this your wish? Is this why you send me your endless gift of songs? Through tears and laughter, through winter and spring, that my music must go on forever. Is this your wish? Is this why you send to me your unending gift of songs? Thank you. Today, the older generation is even more illiterate than the younger generation on Tagore. I, I remember with Dr. Uday Krishna and Anuradha Rai, the previous principal of Sheshadripuram College, some of our good academics in Mysore, Dr. Chanda and others, we did a whole lot of programs in rural colleges where I also and others went and spoke on Tagore. Sheshadripuram itself organized some very good seminars on Tagore. It did not come to us as a surprise that many teachers who came had known so little of Tagore. And even if they knew Tagore, they know him in a very one-dimensional sense. 
uh, which is sad. So first thing I think we should do is run not your usual uh, what what do they call it in the UGC? I forget UGC as a way of ruining every education. Um, uh, in which you should have reading sessions among teachers. You should have reading sessions of passages from Tagore. Discuss among yourself. Talk among yourself first, because it's also. Uh, and I'm not saying don't educate young people, but I think we should start like Tagore himself said, educating ourselves. First, let's see what in our campuses we can do as Tagore study circles, and let these study circles decide what they will study. Even if you meet once a month, doesn't matter. Then communicate it with the teachers. Take it out of your formal education. Today, everybody is busy doing commerce education. Unfortunately, even Seshadri Puram cut away its literature department. Science and literature is suffering because of commerce. Now, how do we bring science and literature back? That's a responsibility of the old people. Today, young people are in a state of anxiety. You can resolve their anxiety by first educating yourself and then communicating it. So I don't want to sound like, let's do this, let's do that. But let us do it, what we can do first among ourselves. And there, I think we can draw upon a lot of resources, both from outside, as we have today, from Thailand and uh, Canada and so on, but also within the country. There, there are some extraordinary, I mentioned Sudhir Kakar. Sudhir Kakar, matter of fact, in his own uh, uh, book, let me read that passage. And this is the experience of most people when I've gone and talked about Tagore. He says, my shallow stance towards Tagore, great Indian psychologist, some foremost psychologist says, my shallow stance towards Tagore, which I now recollect with some shame, was fueled by an early identification with my father's attitudes. He, as I have recounted elsewhere, was a man of no-nonsense rationality, deeply suspicious of Indian mystics and gurus. Even as an aficionado of Sanskrit poetry, my father preferred the skepticism of a Bharati Hari to romantic Kalidasa. Of the English writers, he admired Bernard Shaw and Burton Russell. Our literature departments are full of that, both of whom were condescendingly, and I've noticed it also, dismissive of Tagore. Tagore was also the recipient of more hidden negative feelings towards my father in that I believe that Gurudev had been a foe of Indian nationalism represented by Gandhi. Someone who received his knighthood from the British, this kind of misinformation and I'm sorry to use the word nonsense still goes on, which he returned later only because he had served the Raj well as had my father. This writes Sudhir Kakar in this book, The Young Tagore, he calls him the making of a genius. So I think we have people of this stature self-reflecting and saying a very shallow understanding. So first let us try to do what we can in all our colleges and all our institutions of understanding Tagore, learn how to read Tagore. Uh, I wanted to speak about it, but I'm not going into it. And I think um, we can later talk to scholars like Dr. Ananya, get references of books, Today, you're, you're all an online generation, so you can go and get as much as you want. You can get his full text. When in our time, we have to go to the library and look which book was available, which book was not available. I was introduced by the Macmillan first series published somewhere in the late 60s, if I remember, to Tagore. First, make a collection. When all your library institutions make a Tagore reading collection in English. In our Canada colleges, home, quite a lot of Tagore is translated in Canada. And in Karnataka, we should remember, he had a great affinity to Karnataka because of his love for Carnatic music. In his own uh, music, he borrowed a lot and I believe he was in correspondence with somebody in Darwad and so on, which uh, Dr. Uday Narayan Singh once mentioned to me. So first let us discover him in our own midst, then see how we can celebrate him elsewhere. So this is my humble opinion if I answer the question. So I just wanted to say something about the relevance for youth, Tagore's rather. So first of all, Tagore had great hope and youth. He has this famous poem where he's saying that the youth, the, the old are half dead. The youth has to wake them up, right? <laughs> but the relevance really is 
uh, that uh, belief that Tagore had that we could make society according to the values and principles we hold dear. And this pandemic that we're going through, that's really our biggest fear that we, everything is out of our hands. We are subject to a virus, a disease, um, other people's decisions, and we feel very powerless. And so the message that I always take from Tagore is there is always some power in us to do something. It comes either from creativity or from our solidarity or from our connections or from our values. So that's what I would say is the relevance that life is full of opportunity to make it what the make what we want, not, not exactly what we want, but make more than what we think it is giving us. That's, that's what I see in Tagore. I see a chat question asking Gandhi was for society, Tago was for nature. No, what, Tago, what I said was Gandhi was for nation, Tago was for society, and for him society and nature were interlinked. No, I didn't say that Tago was closer to nature than best society. What he said was, there were two views in which uh, our societies viewed nature and Western society viewed nature. And it's historically true. He, I have passages which I didn't read, in which he says the Northern man had to actually subjugate nature because that was the force with which it appeared. The, the, and we know it in a way in the history of the West that that had happened. He says for us, that was not necessary. We, not part from our traditions in our own nature, it, it was, we lived with it. We were in harmony with it, at least when we started. So in this sense, he talks of the relationship between man and nature in the specific ecological context in which we live. And that's extremely important. Because when we talk of nature, we don't talk of the ecological context in which we live. For example, uh, one of the things I wanted to mention was his father used to take him to the Himalayas, but he never, the mountains never appealed to him. He liked the dry, arid plains of Bengal. He wrote about it. Because as Ananya said, in terms of peasant life, he saw the struggle that people had with in arid regions. In a place like Karnataka, we have arid regions and uh, some bit of uh, deserts put together, which are perhaps larger than, you know, as large as the arid regions of Rajasthan. Now this, this difference between nature in terms of its ecological diversity. We think of nature purely as rich trees, forests, mountains, so on. They are important. But the arid regions are very much important. So when he talked about the difference between the West and the non-West, I won't use the word East, in, with regard to nature, he was also talking of the ecological diversity between them and us. And in his writings, in the way he talks about how culture evolves, and which is so beautiful, it evolves in our relationship, our specific ecological context. And that is true even in terms of the diversity of culture in India. The diversity of culture in India comes from the diversity of ecosystems. And if you destroy the diversity of ecosystems, we also destroy the diversity of our culture. We celebrate our food so much. Bengali food, uh, tribal food, those food, what we grow, what we eat, comes from the ecological diversity. That's what he meant. So it's, uh, you have to understand it that one, that when he talked about the West and the non-West, how the Northern man had to, uh, you know, actually con conquer nature. Meaning it is not some Judeo-Christian attitude that made them conquer nature. It was the very ecological conditions that made it. If I may say, uh, René Dubois, who actually was the one, earliest one who connected ecological destruction to viruses and diseases, uh, he wrote a book inspired by Tagore's writing called Wooing of Nature. But then René Dubois missed the point. What Tagore said was, the Western countries had to constantly woo nature because nature had to be amenable for them. But for us, it was not wooing nature. 
we are, we could actually love nature in the way where we are of course it's a vast long topic but i hope i have some answered my young friend and i'm sure vidya can help you more with your readings and your discussions okay how nature's guide mankind for equality uh you know i think you know from uh, from you know from from his ideas human were well, human beings you know come from nature's are a part of nature's and i think in you know, the to answer in you know, the previous questions i think in you know, a difference between the eastern view of nature's and the western view of nature is that you know we see nature's as a living soul while uh in the west and you know, nature is just an object you know to be studied and you know to be conquered and i uh, and you know to be a part of nature's and you know to work with nature's and it you know will bring uh we human beings you know closer to uh to their sources and that you know would bring uh and you know under the eyes of nature's you know we are all equals and if you know we take care of you know you know our natures and also uh the you know, the ecologies of you know the, that you know that uh, that you know take care of the natures you know whether the uh the communities uh whether or you know the rituals the way of life and also you know especially in the women you know living in uh in 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 in, in the village uh and i think you know that you know would bring us you know closer to the idea of you know of uh, of equality mm-hmm. let me at the outset congratulate the college principal dr ns satish for having uh, organized such a wonderful event it is a, an international webinar on rabindranath tagore nature's philosopher for so this program is being organized also to mark the golden jubilee celebrations of the evening college and i am very happy today that uh, people from more than 16 countries have uh, joined in this program and then uh, it only shows how much people can have concerns about uh, tagore and his writings his thoughts uh, dr jarayu uh, wonderfully spoke of uh, Tagore's idea of world. He recalled, you know, his visit to Siam in 1927 in his appeal for unity of culture, and I was very much impressed with the uh, press clipping that he posted during his course of his lecture. There it was said, Tagore made an appeal for tolerance, worldwide goodwill, and the interchange of cultures. So profound is his appeal. and which is so relevant even today and um, he also spoke to us about he also reminded us that one important and very profound statement which is so relevant even today and it, during his uh, visit to china in 1924 tagore has said the friendship between india and china are the foundation stone of struggling asia it is so true even uh, at this point in time and also finally he spoke of the school under the trees the concept which uh, which shanti uh, nikiniketan espouses and then which, which which in essence speaks of the practical side of tagore as a nature philosopher and uh, we have very eminent environmentalist dr lawrence surendra i am very happy it is he who helped us design this program and i know how many uh, emails you know he has exchanged with the organizers and seeing that this program becomes really fruitful and uh, he recalled to us you know what uh, tagore spoke uh, in in canada in 1929 he spoke on great concepts like freedom leisure in education and creativity these are all the things that we are now uh, 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 talking as though these are all something you know uh, new found terminologies but this great man had uh, exposed all these uh, thoughts then and also uh, madam ananya from canada she recalled and you know connected this issue with the protest that tagore had against racism that was being followed by canada particularly not allowing the six 
so land in canada at that time and all these things so and another thing which dr lawrence surendra told us was we see tagore only as a poet and not as a philosopher we see him less as a philosopher in fact tagore is incomparable and he was a great innovator driven by nature and uh, that way see why tagore is very important for us is tagore saw nature in an integrated sense and uh, he also referred tagore and gandhi and their ideas on sustainability about nearly 9 decades nearly a century ago both tagore and gandhi expressed their concerns about sustainability though they each both of them differed uh, as rightly said by um, professor lawrence surendra gandhi was for a nation state whereas tagore was for society this marks this brings out what a uh, remarkable difference between the two two approaches but then be that as it may uh, one thing i, I must appreciate uh, lawrence surendra ji tagore's thoughts definitely influenced the framing of the indian constitution and he also referred to article 51a of the constitution where it is mandated to protect and improve national natural environment that is most important and today that is made a part of the indian constitution and uh, tagore tagore's greatest contribution is he connected nature and society in all his writings in all his uh, works that we see and uh, i must be i must be particularly thank dr lawrence surendra because it was he who helped us organize a uh, very good number of programs in the sheshadripuram college particularly to mark the 150th birth anniversary of tagore and uh, he also made a small reference to the upanishads the religion of the brahmo samaj in fact the brahmo dharma a book that was compiled by his father tagore's father devendra tagore was on upanishads he removed all the monistic elements and brought out the christian pure universal thoughts uh, called upanishads and that is what is even today guiding the uh, brahmo samaj why i say this is see we look upon tagore as a universal man in a universal procession and you know when we when you have that universal this universal outlook i think tagore got from these upanishadic thoughts which are so beautifully compiled by his father devendra tagore and uh, tagore reminded us that modern luxury and comforts should never be at the cost of degradation of nature this is, a, this is the most important thing that uh, we all need to keep in mind and uh, professor lawrence surendra made a wonderful suggestion that we should read passages from tagore help children read passages from tagore to make them better citizens of the world today we should not talk of citizens of a state or a country they should become citizens of the world we should be great human beings we should become universal beings that is the greatest message that we can take from uh, tagore and dr ananya mukherjee also spoke so well and in fact uh, she touched upon the point that uh, tagore was opposed to industrialization in the sense that it was you no know, it was increasing human greed like it was uh, you know uh, uh, spreading what is called deforestation and destruction of rural life and moorings and uh, she also speak spoke of power of freedom in nature and not just in society that is most important you see when you want to experience freedom it is only in nature that you can have the full expression of freedom and that was the kind of freedom that it was envisioned by uh, tagore in fact freedom uh, as envisioned by gandhi and as envisioned by tagore also has a remarkable marked difference because gandhi said freedom according to him was to be free from slavery of every kind but here uh, tagore sees freedom of of our, of our fullest expression in nature that is the kind of freedom that he was talking and madam also dr nananya spoke very well of on love of trees and she said see we have to till the soil to sustain not to increase our greed so therefore the, the appeal to grow more trees means to help sustain our planet help sustain our soil and nature must be replenished this is the message that uh, dr ananya has given us 
And because Tagore saw the endlessness of nature, this is a very profound thought. And uh, friends, before I want to close, I want to just make one small reference because young people have also posed a very important question. It is how Tagore is relevant for the younger generation. I tell you, our young people today are bothered about productivity and profitability. And they are very much less concerned about ethical outlook. It was Tagore who said material progress did not go hand in hand with social ethics. So we are today faced with two kinds of problems. One is income inequality and the second one is conspicuous consumption of wealthy people. You have to be very cautious about these two. One is income inequality and the second one is the conspicuous consumption of wealthy people. And finally, I would like to recall what Tagore said. True happiness is not at all expensive. It is fullness of life which makes us happy and not fullness of purse. Therefore, we have to understand that material uh, wants can always be limited and inner happiness, happiness comes out, 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 of our, uh, out of our inner being. Therefore, that we need to uh, develop and that we need to culture in order to have a better world for all of us. Thank you very much. I once again uh, thank all the distinguished spe speakers for their wonderful contribution. And today's topic has been really you know, uh, thought provoking and definitely it will help us to read more about Tagore, to understand Tagore better. And uh, uh, let us not just uh, circumscribe him to the, 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 the point of a, be being a poet, but he has a very larger dimension. He's a philosopher. And therefore, when we say he's a philosopher, he's a philosopher for all times, for eternity. Thank you very much.